Good evening, Frank. Thank you very much indeed for your warm introduction. It's a great pleasure and a privilege to be here. Uh, Tim Wallington, I know, did a superb warm-up act last week, so I just hope that what I'm going to tell you will continue that theme. Um, I'll just, uh, Frank's already very kindly introduced me. I better just uh, say that uh, this is the slide that I'd like you to look at briefly. Um, Edward Jenner, as you'll have heard last week, um, is one of the great figures, one of the great godlike figures in the history of medicine, the history of science, but I'd like you to look at that picture and ask, is this the picture of a saint? Is this the face of a saint, or is it the face of somebody rather more sinister? A uh, quick word to explain why I'm here. I mean, my background is indeed in uh, endocrinology, diabetes, and obesity, and my research group up in Liverpool was grappling with some of the biggest issues in obesity. Uh, the first one is shown here. Uh, this is, how did this chap get into this state? And the second big question is shown here too, which way was he facing when the photograph was taken? <laughs> but moving rapidly on, we now live in the center of the known universe. This is the tiny village of Rockhampton, indicated by the red dot here, out in the wilds of South Gloucestershire. And it's about five miles south of the town of Barclay, which as you will have heard last week is where Edward Jenner was born where he worked, where he lived and died, and where he's buried today. Um, just out of interest, this is roughly the bit to the right of the River Severn is Jenner's catchment area. It covered about 2,000 square miles, and when Jenner did his house visits, he'd set off on horseback, and he would very often stay with the patient's family overnight, and he was a great and very entertaining person. So I think a house visit from Dr. Edward Jenner would have been really quite something. Barclay is famous in the history of medicine and the history of science because it is where the first properly recorded vaccination took place, and this was in the middle of May 1796. As Frank has said, Edward Jenner was not the first to think of vaccination or even the first to experiment with it, but as you'll hear, he was the first one to drag it into mainstream medicine and the first one to really make doctors take it seriously and start practicing it. So this is a rather fanciful image here. This is the, the first uh, vaccination properly recorded. And the, the, if you like, the dramatis personae, the cast of characters, begins with a cow called Blossom, who has been omitted from the picture in the interests of clarity. And Edward Jenner is seated there. He is scratching a rather disgusting fluid which originated from Blossom's udder into the arm of James Phipps, who is the eight-year-old son of the Jenner's gardener. And the fluid he's scratching is from a cowpox pustule which has just been lanced by Jenner on the hand of the young woman in the background there, Sarah Nelms, a rather upper-class milkmaid. And James Phipps is obviously there as the guinea pig, and I'll come back to this image later on and explain a bit more about the context. But again, at this stage, you need to ask why exactly Jenner was doing this rather bizarre, disgusting thing with a rather filthy fluid that originated from pustules on the udder of a cow called Blossom. Quick word about smallpox. Well, I and I see one of my contemporaries over there, we qualified in medicine in 1977. So in a former century, not a whole century ago, you understand, but feels like it sometimes. And I never saw a case of smallpox because it was already on its last legs when we did our medical training and when we qualified as doctors. And one of my counterparts was prof of medicine in Halifax, Nova Scotia, back in 1914, said the fact is that even then they'd forgotten what smallpox was like because it was already being defeated by vaccination. And at that stage, there were still 63 years of smallpox's free existence on the planet to go, and in that time it would kill 250 million people. So in its heyday, which was about two and a half centuries, smallpox was one of the great lotteries of life. It was one of the rivers that everyone had to cross, according to De La Condamine. Uh, you had about a one in three chance of getting it during a lifetime. If you got it, you had, on aggregate, about a one in four chance of dying from it. So across most of the planet, smallpox killed about one person in 12. So it was one of the major killers. And about 90% of its victims were under the age of five, so it was also a very brutal, a very mesmerizing killer that really had a grip of fear over a lot of the people on the planet. If you got it and you survived, you weren't necessarily that lucky because you had about a one in three chance of being badly scarred. 
and we're not talking a bit about acne here, we're talking about scars that go deep into the skin, that heal with fibrosis, that open up the pits, and some people actually kill themselves because when they recovered they couldn't face what they saw in the mirror. As well as the skin being scarred, it often got the cornea, the transparent front of the eye, and it was one of the commonest causes of blindness in young adults in Europe as a result of that. So it's a pretty mean disease. And just show you a couple of pictures. The little boy on the left is actually very, very famous because this picture was on the World Health Organization smallpox recognition card. And when the volunteers were going out to vaccinate the villages in India, Pakistan and Bangladesh to try and stamp out the outbreaks of smallpox as they arose, they would take these cards out, they'd go into the village and they'd ask the school children, because they were the best at identifying the early cases, have you seen anybody like this? So the little boy is in the early stage, he's covered in pustules, which are big blisters filled with milky pus, looks pretty unpleasant. Uh, the young lady on the right of the screen there was from Zaire in the 1960s, and she's a couple of stages further on. So those pustules have dried up, she's left with a lot of scarring, she's left with a lot of swelling, because the inflammation is still settling down. And because of the swelling, her eyes are tight shut, so when the photograph was taken, neither she nor the people holding her up knew whether she would be able to see again when finally she could open her eyes. So it was a really foul, horrible disease. It would be lovely to say that medical science had risen to the occasion and came up with a cure, uh, but I'm afraid once you got smallpox, you took your chances, and we as doctors were able to do very, very little other than give effectively palliative care and let nature run its course. And if you go back to the 1770s, so around Jenner's time, leeches were used. Leeches were used for everything. It was one of the doctor's stock trades. It did absolutely nothing for the disease, but it was a means of allowing the doctor to present you with a bill, because at least he was doing something. And the same went for salts that gave you diarrhea or that made you throw up. Uh, the color red was great. It was thought to protect against smallpox. It was thought to cure smallpox. And here's a bit of nationalism for you. When one of the Austrian emperors was dying of smallpox, they sent to England for 14 yards of heavy red English flannel, and they wrapped him up, and the poor bugger dropped dead on the spot. <laughs> so that proved that the color red was not actually that good for treating smallpox. So the mortality, again, depending on whether you had the major or the minor form of smallpox, was somewhere between 20 and 50% in the 1770s. So wind forward 200 years, and the first thing that struck me when I read about the current care in the Department of Health Instructions was that if the patient was female, you should remove all mirrors from her sick room. Because being female, she might not have the moral fiber necessary to cope with what she saw in the mirror. This was serious, this is what they recommended. In the 70s, we had intensive care, we had antiviral drugs, but to put it together and the mortality, even then, 200 years later, was only slightly better overall. So once you got smallpox, you took your chances, as people always had done. So, cure doesn't work, what about prevention? Well, there were various sort of precursors to vaccination. People actually used smallpox pus instead of cowpox. And it sounds scary as hell, but it did actually work. And it had a relatively low mortality rate, about one in 50. But what Edward Jenner did, as you would have heard last week if you were here, was that he brought vaccination, so the use of cowpox rather than native smallpox, onto the scene as a therapeutic move. Uh, Edward Jenner is one of my heroes. When I was researching the book, he was one of the people I really enjoyed reading about. I'd love to have known him. He was a, an absolutely fascinating chap. He was a gentleman doctor, an FRS, so fellow of the Royal Society, very serious scientist. Um, as a scientist, he was a polymath. He flitted from ornithology to geology to botany. He did all sorts of things. He was a dilettante, never quite finished quite a lot of experiments. And he wrote up some really dire experiments and was really gutted when the Royal Society said, this is garbage, we can't print it. Um, but he did a lot of good things as well. Again, great company. Um, he played the flute and the violin and sang. He wrote poetry. I think there's just time to give you one of his poems. It was to celebrate the death of Dr. Waite, who was a doctor who had perfected medicinal gingerbread for killing intestinal worms. And this is a little, it's actually a proto-limerick. It scans just like a limerick, and it goes as follows. It begins with the Latin names of the worms. 
Ascarides, Tyres, Lumbrici, and all, ye kyle sucking insects that tremblingly crawl, no more be afraid, you're quite safe in our guts, for weight has done making his gingerbread nuts. <laughs> so, Edward Jenner, FRS, absolutely wonderful man. Uh, he got his FRS for nothing to do with medicine. He got it for working out how the cuckoo chick gets rid of the other chicks and eggs in the nest. And again, it's a great story, which we haven't got time to go into today. Uh, Jenner learned his medicine really at the feet of John Hunter, surgeon extraordinary to His Majesty, King George. And indeed, Hunter, you know, there's enough material there for three or four other lectures. Uh, just suffice it to say, he was extraordinary. He was the man that kept Jenner's scientific interest afloat after Jenner left London and went back to the quiet backwaters of, um, of Berkeley. But he began his medical training as an apprentice to a man called Daniel Ludlow in the town of Chipping Sodbury. And I'll come back to Chipping Sodbury in a minute. But this is where we have to think about Jenner's scientific contribution. Again, this comes in to the anti-vaccination debate because later you'll hear that people tried to demolish Jenner's approach, his systematic scientific approach, and they used the fact that he had been an imperfect experimenter in other domains to try and back up their claims. So Jenner was acquainted with an observation. He didn't make it himself. He was told by it, by somebody you're about to meet. From this, he deduced that cowpox might protect against smallpox. He formulated the hypothesis that if you give somebody cowpox artificially, then that person will be protected against smallpox. He conducted an experiment, which we've already seen the outline of, to try and see if that hypothesis were true. And then he verified the results by challenging his guinea pig with smallpox. And again, we'll hear about that in a second. And then the two bits that had defeated everybody else who had thought of this, he then decided he would tell the world about it. He would publish his results. He would disseminate his findings. And most difficult of all, given the fact that the medical profession then was even more stuck in the mud and conservative than it is today, he was going to change medical practice for the better. So here's where we begin, actually, with the observation. And again, vaccination is giving people cowpox to prevent them from getting naturally acquired smallpox. And cowpox was a bit of a legend. It was an occupational hazard of girls in the milking parlour. And this is what it looked like. This is what Blossom's other would have looked like. So you've got these rather nasty pustules. And if the milkmaid has got a cut in her hand, then she will pick up the virus of cowpox. And she will develop very similar looking pustules because she'll have caught the disease off the cow. And the legend was, as told to Jenna, by an anonymous milkmaid who was consulting him as an apprentice. He would have been probably 16 years old at this time. And there was an outbreak of smallpox nearby, and basically Jenna was told to brief everybody that they might need to take care. And this milkmaid said, I am not in the least bit worried about smallpox because I've already had cowpox. And Jenna, like all the other doctors of the age, had not been told about this, didn't make the connection, didn't do anything about it for quite a long time, but parked the knowledge and returned to it later on. Now, the reason I hesitated with chipping Sodbury is that it is desperately easy to say sodding Chipbury. <laughs> and when I went to give a talk in chipping Sodbury, that's exactly what I bloody well did. <laughs> and they were very, very forgiving, actually. The inhabitants of chipping Sodbury are very nice, warm, caring, forgiving people. But it was deeply embarrassing at the time. So here we have the observation being presented to Jenna by the friendly milkmaid in chipping Sodbury. And this was the start of an experiment that actually took Jenna 30 years to complete. And we know that he was interested in it because he belonged to a very interesting society called the Convivio Medical Society, which met at this building. It still exists. It's the ship inn just off the A38 at Alveston, outside the town of Thornbury. Um, it's very similar. In those days, they presumably did not have very many ABBA tribute nights as they do today, but otherwise it's pretty well the same. And the purpose of this society was to meet regularly. They're all doctors in practice locally. They met for the united purposes of having a good time and talking about science and medicine. But in the minutes, there is the entry by the then chair saying that they'd had a great discussion. But if Edward Jenner persisted in trying to tell people that cow, cow pox could be used to protect against smallpox, then they would throw him out of the society. So clearly he was talking about it, 
but not doing anything. And the reception of his medical colleagues is interesting. They simply did not believe it. This was a legend from the lower classes, the milkmaids, nothing to be taken seriously by doctors or proper scientists. But Jenner finally got around to doing his experiment, and this takes us back to this picture. So 14th of May, 1796, and he is inoculating James Phipps with cowpox plus from Sarah Nelms's hand and ultimately from Blossom. And what happened was that the lad developed a small sore at the inoculation site on his arm. He had a bit of a fever and then he settled completely back to normal again. Now Jenner then had to test him to see if he was actually immune, against, immune to smallpox, protected against smallpox. And all he had to do was the then standard medical procedure, which was to give the lad therapeutic smallpox. This was a process called variolation. And again, this was the precursor to vaccination. So you think this is outrageous. This man gave this boy not only cowpox, but then deliberately infected him with smallpox. But in fact, that second thing, although it sounds a lot scarier, was actually the bit of medicine that was accepted practice at the time. And the great thing was that absolutely nothing happened. If you variolated somebody, you gave them smallpox, normally they got a nasty ulcer where you'd scratch the smallpox pus in, and then after a few days you would have satellite lesions breaking out perhaps a couple of hundred of them over the rest of the body, and people could be quite sick with it before they got better. But this lad showed none of that at all. So this is one of the great eureka moments in the history of medicine and science. Jenner had proved that he had managed to make somebody immune to smallpox. So very excited, he sent the paper off. He wrote this case up and lots of other cases, together with observations of people who'd caught cowpox naturally and had not got smallpox, even though they'd had plenty of opportunity. Sent it off to the Royal Society, and they rejected the paper. Uh, Jenner was quite easily bruised, and he was very paranoid. He suspected that they were out to get him and steal his secret. And in this case, they were actually probably right, because the referee was a seriously evil individual called Evelyn Hume. So what Jenner did was he did some more cases, uh, he did some more experiments, he wrote them up and he self-published. And it was a paper called The Inquiry into the Causes and Effects of the Varioli Vaccini, a disease known as the cowpox in the countries of England, most particularly Gloucestershire, so a long title. It's known as The Inquiry. And this is one of the greatest pinnacles in the whole of the history of medicine and it was not peer-reviewed, and it was self-published by a little print house in Soho. But when it came out, it was an instant sensation because it was a do-it-yourself guide to vaccination. And remember that doctors at the time had never heard of cowpox. They had no idea that it could be therapeutically useful. So what Jenner was doing was he was displaying this for everybody to see. So this is a wonderful example of open access publication. And the doctors up till then had guarded their practice very jealously. The variolators, for example, had their own private recipes. But Jenner didn't want any of that. He wanted this out in the open so that people could exploit what he discovered and use it for the good of mankind. And it was an instant sensation, partly because of pictures like this. And this showed the doctors exactly what the lesions of cowpox would look like so that they could then go out and find material and vaccinate their own patients to protect them against smallpox. And here's a wonderful example as to how quickly vaccination took off. And this is a, really quite a moving expedition which was called the Royal Philanthropic Expedition of King Carlos IV of Spain. Uh, it wasn't entirely philanthropic because he needed to impress the Spanish colonies from whom the tax revenue was drying up a bit. And what King Carlos, King Charles, decided to do was to send this new, apparently divine gift of vaccination to the Spanish colonies. So they organized a little flotilla of ships, which set sail from La Coruña in Galicia, northern Spain, across the Atlantic, and there the expedition split. Part left the ship on the Atlantic side, crossed Mexico on foot and horseback, picked up a ship on the other side, came back round the back of the world, the other bit went down through Central America, going right into the heart of Peru, and then boats to take them back around Tierra del Fuego, back across the Atlantic to home again. And the whole thing took three years. And everywhere they went, they were fantastically greeted. Uh, it's just an amazing, again, a very, very good accounts to read of this. Uh, and it worked as a, as a propaganda coup, really. It really did work. Now, you might ask how they managed to get vaccination all the way across the Atlantic and back around the world.
And the answer was they started in the local orphanage in La Coruña, where they acquired 20 orphan Spanish boys, and they vaccinated them in pairs every 10 days. So the first pair, just as they left port, 10 days later, they harvested the nice juice from those two. They did the next pair, they saved the juice and so on. So by the time they'd crossed the Atlantic, they'd taken it sort of arm to arm all the way across. Uh, the Mexican party then left the 20 orphaned Spanish boys to be raised by the church, popped down the road to the nearest Mexican orphanage where they acquired another 20 willing volunteers and <laughs> took them for a trip of their lives around the back of the world. So all's well that ends well. And if you then wind forward very rapidly, I mean, suffice it to say the vaccination did work. It was highly effective. And it cleared progressively large swathes of the planet of smallpox. And by the time Jenna had died, they'd managed to clear the province of Lombardy in northern Italy, completely of smallpox, which again was completely unprecedented. And that process continued and by 1967, which was the time that the WHO, the World Health Organization, decided that they could actually wipe out smallpox for once and for all. You'll see that it had been cornered in South America, sub-Saharan Africa, uh, Southern Asia, so India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and a bit of Indonesia. And the World Health Organization, again, set out on a concerted global campaign to stamp out smallpox from those areas using mass vaccination, using careful targeting of early outbreaks and so on. And they succeeded. And uh, Jenner's vision of a world completely free from smallpox, which he predicted within a couple of years of actually publishing his inquiry, it was completely an outrageous thing to predict, but he, was, he, he went for it, and that vision was actually realized. And the little girl here was found hiding under a sack in a village on the island of Bola, in the mouth of the Ganges, and she was the last remnant of a little outbreak of smallpox, which they, the local authorities wanted to cover up because it would have been at a mission of defeat, because smallpox was so nearly stamped out. And she was the last one to get the more severe form of smallpox, so-called variola major. And she survived and is still alive and well today on the island of Bola. It took a couple of years to stamp out the last vestige, which was a little sort of enclave of smallpox in the Horn of Africa. And the main kind of smallpox there was actually variola minor. And the last victim of that was a uh, a hospital porter called Ali Ma Malin in the town of Merka in Somalia. And what he did wrong was to jump into a jeep which arrived with a couple of little girls in the back, both with smallpox, one of whom was obviously dying, and took the jeep, directed the driver around the back of the compound to the isolation unit. And he was in the jeep only for a few minutes. And one of the little girls died, the other one survived. He then went down a couple of weeks later with this mysterious pustular illness which they took ages to diagnose. And even though he worked in a hospital where they dealt with smallpox, even though he was a volunteer vaccinator himself, you would have thought he would have been vaccinated, but he hadn't been. But anyway, he survived, and he was the last victim of naturally occurring smallpox on the planet. Uh, they then had to wait a couple of years to make sure that they hadn't missed anything. And during that time, apparently the phone rang 9,000 times in WHO headquarters in Geneva, but luckily there weren't any further outbreaks. So 8th of May 1980, just over 30 years ago, the World Health Organization declared that target zero, in other words, a complete wipeout of smallpox from the whole of the planet had been achieved. And to date, this is the only infection that mankind, the only human infection that mankind has set out to exterminate and has succeeded in exterminating. So back to Jenner, we're now coming into the anti-vaccination bit. So this is all really good news. I felt I had to portray the positive side here to rev you all up a bit. But we're now coming into the slightly creepy side, which is where people look at what Jenner's achieved and look at what it's led to and ask quite searching questions about whether this globally is the right thing to have done. Thomas Jefferson wrote to Jenner while he was still alive and said, basically, you're a great bloke. What you have discovered will get rid of smallpox. And your memory will be the fact that smallpox is no longer with us. And that's great, but the centenary issue of the British Medical Journal in 1896 described Jenner as a prophet without honor in his own country. And this statue, wonderful bronze by Call the Marshal, actually epitomizes that statement and underlines just how true it was. Because it was unveiled in 
Trafalgar Square by Prince Albert with much pomp and circumstance. And it stayed there for precisely four years. And then under cover of darkness one night, it was carted away. And you can still see it today, but you've got to go to the Italian gardens in Kensington Gardens. And the reason it was carted away is that the anti-vaccinationists decided that it was morally wrong for Edward Jenner, discoverer of vaccination, to be sharing Trafalgar Square with the nation's real heroes, the likes of Nelson. So he was topped. And if you look at where the opposition came from, well, apparently the almighty stepped in very early and took exception to vaccination. And people trawled the Bible for little quotes that could be used as evidence that vaccination was blasphemy. And they managed to find, for example, the story of Job, who was the unfortunate gentleman on the ground on the left, and he is being smitten by Satan with a curse of boils. And the reasoning was that because the curse of boils probably quite looked like a vaccination scar, this proved that Satan was actually the first vaccinator. And developing that theme, uh, John Birch took against vaccination because it was a terrifically good uh, retrospective birth control method for all those poor people who kept having children and couldn't bring them up properly. And smallpox, as you know, killed off a lot of kids, particularly in poor families. So that was nature's way of achieving a balance. And for vaccination to come in and prevent that from happening was blasphemy because it was clearly God's <coughs> will that these unfortunate children should die and that smallpox should be the thing that killed them. Now, that was in 1806, and 90 years later, we have the same thing being, uh, being projected again. And basically, uh, vaccination prevents God from determining who's going to die and when they're going to do it. Uh, so it's subverting the divine plan. So you might be able to pick holes in the chain of logic in that. Uh, I'm afraid doctors are not that much better. And very soon after the inquiry was published, lots of doctors uh, started reporting problems with vaccination. Lots of them were actually doing very comfortably with private practice, which was being undermined by Jenner's desire to bring vaccination to as wide a public as possible. So, for example, there were papers published in reputable med medical journals by respected doctors, which proved that if your child was vaccinated, it would probably turn into a cow. And the picture here is a lad in Peckham who, a few days after being vaccinated, was running around on the floor on all fours, bellowing, and little bumps beginning to appear where the horns were going through his forehead. And you'll see that the artist has actually made his face look quite bovine in outline. They also said that it would give you tuberculosis, that it would make you mad, give you syphilis, give you blood poisoning, give you diabetes, etc., etc. So quite a scary list of potential side effects there. And here is one of the responses to the lunacy of the suggestion that if you're vaccinated, you will turn into a cow. And this is a great, there's a huge amount happening in this picture. Uh, it's by Gilray, who's one of the great political cartoonists of the day. And if you just look at the young lady in the middle, you'll see that she looks rather apprehensive. She's got every reason to look apprehensive because if you look around, you'll see that people have already been vaccinated and she's in the process of being vaccinated. But the ones who've already been there and done that have actually got bits of cow sprouting out of their backsides, their arms, their heads, their eyes. It's a pretty gruesome spectacle. And what Gilray is doing here, he's not trying to point out the supposed hazards of vaccination. He's deliberately lampooning the people who are stupid enough to believe that if you were vaccinated, you would turn into a cow. Um, unfortunately, there was a bit of a grain of truth in some of the objections. And of that list of things that vaccination was supposed to cause, uh, you could get blood poisoning because in the early days, vaccination was not a sterile procedure. So you could get blood poisoning and it could kill you. And it did occasionally. And the other one that people really worried about was syphilis. And again, if you think back to that Spanish orphanage, if one of those orphan boys had had congenital syphilis, which is possible because it was often clinically silent, even in kids up to the age of 10, then that syphilis would have been spread by anybody who'd had the arm-to-arm -arm vaccination. So in theory, if there'd been one child with syphilis, you could actually have infected an awful lot of the Spanish colonies. And syphilis was something that people really were very afraid of. And if you look at this very unpleasant picture, you can see exactly why people were so terrified. In fact, they were often more terrified of syphilis than they were of smallpox. So this brings us to further opposition, medical type opposition to vaccination. And one of my anti-heroes, I had to admire her because she was a lady of 
immense erudition and energy, but she was quite a difficult character, I think. There was this lady called Laura C. Little, who described herself as a natural healer, an activist, and she wrote a lot. And she wrote a book called Crimes of the Cowpox Ring, which is basically a conspiracy theory tract uh, pointing out the vaccination was being inflicted on the children of America through a consortium that included the people who made cowpox vaccine, the government officials who profited from it, the doctors who profited from it, and the authorities who just wanted everybody under their control. And she collected about 300 case reports of people who'd come to grief of some sort after being vaccinated. And here, for example, is her case number 30, uh, a lad aged seven who'd been forcibly vaccinated at school. He didn't want it, his parents didn't want it, but he was vaccinated and he died sometime after that. And there were more medical disasters that were written up. Uh, for example, Immanuel Kant, uh, philosopher, he speculated that it cannot be a good thing to put animal stuff into humans. That's basically what he's saying. Um, and Ernest McCormack, a bit later, picked up that theme with a bit of wonderful mathematics. He said, it takes a human 21 years to reach maturity. It takes a cow three years to reach maturity. Therefore, cow cells divide seven times faster than human cells. Therefore, if you put cow stuff into man, man cells are suddenly going to start dividing seven times faster than they should do. Therefore, you will get cancer. And again, you might be able to detect one or two chinks in the armor of logic in that argument. But again, people believed it. And going back to Laura C. Little, she wrote up this case here. Um, if you make a note of his name, Benjamin Olawine, and plug him into Google, you'll see that he's still out there um, being used as a case, albeit a historical one, by the anti-vaccinationists about the risks of vaccination. And he is a young man who looks apprehensive. He's close to the end of his life when this photograph was taken. He's got a very large and unpleasant soft tissue tumor, sarcoma of some sort, growing out of his upper chest. It was the same side that he was vaccinated on, but it was nowhere near the vaccination site, and it was nothing to do with the vaccination. But again, it made a good story, and Laura C. Little had the sarcastic footnote to his photograph, said, saved from smallpox by vaccination, the implication being, but look what vaccination did to this previously healthy young man. Uh, the big names were recruited uh, in the battle against vaccination. So, for example, George Bernard Shaw, you know, the foremost writer of the day, um, said vaccination is a particularly filthy piece of witchcraft. And Alfred Russell Wallace, who was in with the theory of natural selection, just after Darwin, and probably at least in part independently from Darwin, he, despite being a great scientist, managed to put two completely wrong things into this brief two sentences here. He said that vaccination is probably the cause of a greater mortality than smallpox itself, which of course is rubbish, cannot be proved ever to have saved a single life. Also rubbish. And if you look at the impact that these statements had, they probably were responsible for some thousands of deaths in the UK with people not having their kids vaccinated. And again, we'll come back to those statistics in a moment. The thing that really got people going in the UK was the clumsiness with which uh, attempts were made to legislate for compulsory vaccination. The Vaccination Acts came in over a couple of decades or more, and they began rather softly, softly. They basically said the vaccination is clearly a good thing. There's lots of evidence. So we're encouraging all parents to have their newborn children vaccinated against smallpox. Uh, that didn't quite work. So in 1853, they made vaccination of the newborn compulsory with a fine of five shillings if you refuse to have your child vaccinated. And that was then beefed up five years later and it was enforced and if you didn't pay the fine then you went to prison and if you just think about that uh, they were described as perverse outcomes but I don't think they're at all perverse I think they're entirely predictable this was very socially divisive because for a wealthy family five bob was affordable but for a family close to the breadline five shillings is probably a month's wages so if that couldn't be paid then the father the breadwinner was put in prison so you can just imagine how that is going to be received. That's just ridiculous, really. Widespread outrage, civil disobedience. They used to burn copies of the Vaccination Acts in public. And the, the Anti-Vaccination League, one of many organizations that sprung up to oppose vaccination, came into existence at about this time. And here's a flyer for an event they held in Stanley Bridge. 
where they publicly burned the vaccination acts and then they had an auction to raise money for prominent anti-vaccinationists who were currently <coughs> languishing in prison. This actually is where the, the, uh, the term conscientious objectors came for because before they repealed the vaccination acts, they actually gave you liberty to appeal to a local magistrate and if you could convince that person that in all conscience you did not want your child vaccinated, then they let you off. But again, that's fine for somebody who's articulate, who knows the game. Uh, it'd be hopeless for somebody who is tongue-tied in the presence of authority, who doesn't know what the rules of engagement are. So again, very, very unfair. Finally, they were repealed in 1909. So all that actually had a rather predictable outcome, in that there were parts of the country where the anti-vaccinationists actually held sway, the members of parliament were anti-vaccination, uh, Gloucester, which of course was Jenner's own county town, was one such centre, Leeds, Leicester, Glasgow, Liverpool. And here's one magnificent demonstration of the fact that vaccination works, but only if you have it. If you don't have it, it's not going to work. And the lad on the left and the lad on the right were members of the same class at school, and they met the same index case who was brewing up smallpox on the same day. And the lad on the right obviously had been vaccinated. The lad on the left, his parents, who'd been whipped up by the local MP, had refused to have their son vaccinated with obvious consequences. Just going back to Laura C. Little, um, her case number 30 was actually her own son. And when you read it, it's actually a very moving description. She gives a very brief clinical vignette, so his case gets only a few lines in this series of 300 cases of medical disasters. But if you jump to the end of this little tract, which, like Jenna's inquiry, was self-published, um, there's this conversation between the mother and her dead son, which, again, is quite, quite moving reading, actually. And there's a lot of emotion in there. And the bare facts are that he was her only child, and she'd split up from her husband at this stage, so it was a big, big loss. Uh, he was vaccinated in September 1895, and he died the following April. So it's a tragedy, huge tragedy. You can understand why she was motivated to do down vaccination and Jenner's invention. But if you look in a bit more detail at what happened, and again, it's not explicit. You have to dig in and put things together from the way she describes it. But he was vaccinated in September and got over it. He didn't like it, but he got over it. He then got measles, which was one of the main killers of children then, and he recovered from that. And he then ran up against diphtheria in April, and he wasn't so lucky, and he died. But if you look at what was happening to American children at that time, then you'll see that his run of bad luck was by no means exceptional. And at that time, um, only six out of ten American children actually lived to count ten candles on their birthday cake. The others died. Mortality from diphtheria was 40% if you got it. So it's a huge tragedy, personal tragedy for her and for him, but it's not out of the ordinary, and again, it's nothing to do with vaccination. This was also a time when other interests came into the anti-vaccination argument, and alternative therapies, alternative in inverted commas medicine, was in on the act pretty early. And it was partly a philosophical objection to vaccination, but it was also with the aim of making quite a lot of money out of the doubts that hovered around vaccination, whether it was safe, whether it was appropriate. And one of the people in at the very beginning was uh, the founder of chiropractic, D.D. Palmer. He had a son called B.J. Palmer, so D.D. and B.J. are the two big names and initials. And his tract on the science of chiropractic basically said that all diseases are due to misalignment or so-called subluxation of the vertebrae in the neck. And that includes things that we now would regard as infections. So smallpox, chickenpox, uh, which they actually thought were the same disease, diphtheria, they were all due to misalignment of one or two vertebrae in the neck. So if you could fix that, get the vertebra back into line, you would cure the patient. And if you read this thing, he says it's a miracle cure. I had a patient who was dying of smallpox. I manipulated the neck, the vertebra that was out of line, that was pressing on nerves, that was preventing the body from being nourished appropriately from the spinal cord, uh, came back into line and the patient recovered. And he says at the bottom very tellingly, replacing luxation, so realigning these vertebrae, will cure the patient and give the death blow to the vaccine poison swindle. So that shows rather clearly where he's coming from. 
And the interesting thing is if you look on chiropractic websites today, you'll find that the fundamentalist so-called chiropractors are still plugging this line. They still tell their patients not to vaccinate their children because infections are nothing to do with viruses or germs, whatever they may be, they're to do with troubles in the cervical vertebrae in the neck. So the great vaccination debate, we're coming up to the crescendo of this now, um, I spotted this sign on a field not too far from Jenna the other day, and it's terrific because this is a field in which there was a great deal of bull. And it's a war of disinformation. It's been going on since just after the publication of the inquiry, and I don't see any sign of it actually going away. And it is a war of disinformation. So if you look at what the anti-vaccinationists have done, I've given them pluses here according to the gravity of what I consider their crimes to be. So they use anecdote, or they have used anecdote. They've not just manipulated statistics, they've mutilated them, they've bent them. They've actually, for example, transposed vaccinated versus unvaccinated groups in tables in the paper to prove that vaccination gave you smallpox. That's what they did. Uh, they lied, they committed scientific fraud, they covered things up, and they recruited celebrities like George Bernard Shaw, like uh, Russell Wallace, to basically tell people that uh, vaccination was bad, and they used the weight of their celebrity status rather than evidence to get that message across. The big problem was that there are two sides to every debate, and the anti-vaccinationists at various times have been guilty of exactly the same crimes. I don't think they're quite as bad, and that's why I've given them fewer plus signs, but they still have committed these crimes. They've also used anecdote instead of evidence. They've bent statistics when it suited them. They've lied. They've committed scientific fraud. They've recruited celebrities and so on. I've put plus and minus pious because one of the greatest examples of scientific fraud was actually a rather nice, well-intentioned one. When they were vaccinating in India, uh, there was a sizable proportion of the Hindu population who did not want vaccination because the cow is sacred. And anything to do with cows was just complete taboo. And there was an impasse, so the Hindu population not being vaccinated, until luckily an ancient Sanskrit manuscript came to light. It was fantastic. And when this was translated, it dated back to about 900, so it was seriously old. And it was on ancient paper, everything. And it actually showed that one of the ancient Hindu physicians had not only identified cowpox, he described these blisters on the udders of cows, but amazingly said that if you collect this fluid and put it into the skin of normal people, they will forever be protected against smallpox. So that was great, and Hindus said, it's absolutely fine, let's go with it. So they went with it. Uh, six months later, they discovered that the paper on which this was written was artificially aged. And further investigation revealed that it had been written in a hotel room in Madras by the British Museum's expert on ancient Sanskrit. <laughs> so complete, completely fraudulent, totally dishonest, but it did actually achieve an end. And you know, it's wrong, but it worked. So back to poor old Jenna, um, well, he has been the lens that has focused a lot of the anger over vaccination. So there are specific things that people don't like about Jenna. He wasn't a very good experimenter. But any time that vaccination is in the firing line, a lot of the aggro, a lot of the antagonism actually reflects all the way back to Jenna as the guy who put it on the map to begin with. And this is the picture that I put up at the beginning. And I put it to you that this is actually the face of a demon. It's not the face of a saint. Uh, this is from a statue uh, which was uh, commissioned and it was designed to show Jenner as an energetic, focused man. And this image was taken from the statue, but it's been hardened up because the people that distributed that image were actually the anti-vaccinationists. And this was part of their propaganda to show that Jenner was not a saint. He was actually a hard, driven man the child he's vaccinated is, of course, his own son. So he's doing something obscene and bestial, he's doing it to his own son. And as an example of just how much people hated Jenner, uh, Alexander Wheeler, who is one of the anti-vaccinationist leading lights, basically said that his science was lousy, uh, his experiments were useless, and it's a good thing he's dead, actually, because the best thing we can do is to forget that he ever lived. So that's an example of how strongly people felt about Jenner. And if you look critically at the inquiry and the way he went about his experiments, I'm afraid you have to admit that he was not perfect. He was not a perfect scientist. 
he was very good for the day. But again, when such a lot rides on the way that he conducted his science, you have to be critical about the detail of how he went about it and how he interpreted it. Uh, the inquiry is great, but it is flawed. And you don't even know how many subjects he vaccinated because he talks about a number of adults. You don't know how many were test variolated. Do you remember at the beginning of July, he went back and gave smallpox deliberately to James Phipps to see if he was immune. We don't know how many times he did that to the other patients, so you can't really say that they were definitely immune. Uh, there's a cover-up, because one of his patients didn't turn up for follow-up. Today's NHS, that would be because the notes had gone missing or the appointment went to the wrong address. In this case, it's because the boy had died. And he died of a fever, what was called the workhouse fever, shortly after he'd been vaccinated, and it's entirely possible that he died of septicemia actually due to Jenna's vaccination. And Jenna did not admit that the lad had died in the first edition of the, of the, uh, the inquiry. He just said that he, it was impossible to follow him up. Uh, Jenna was also very dogmatic. And again, he was very defensive when he was under fire from his critics. And he denied a couple of things that were quite important. Firstly, he claimed that one vaccination in childhood would protect you for the rest, the rest of your life. So he denied that immunity could not be lifelong. And he stuck to that line, and so did all his disciples, even when abundant evidence started to come in that 12 years, for example, after being vaccinated, people were getting smallpox and dying from it. So when smallpox vaccination was around, it was done for people at risk. It was done every 10 or 12 years. And if there's an outbreak, then you were done again. So it was not lifelong protection, but Jenner, again, believed that uh, this was protection for life. And the other thing, he refused to acknowledge that there were risks. And, for example, when the suspicion that syphilis could be spread um, by vaccination, uh, there were 300 English doctors who wrote a letter to the Times saying that this was absolutely impossible. And Jenner wasn't one of them, but he supported that line. And they took a long time to retract, even when very, very strong evidence emerged that syphilis could be spread. So I showed you that people like George Bernard Shaw were probably responsible for thousands of deaths by stirring up anti-vaccination feeling. By the end of his life, Jenner will undoubtedly have saved millions of lives, but by sticking to dogma and refusing to acknowledge that people who'd been vaccinated once as a child might have to be vaccinated again, he probably indirectly was responsible for the deaths of some thousands of people in the UK. So Jenner is still one of my heroes, and if you go to the, uh, uh, the Welcome Trust collection, go up to the rare books, which is on the gallery at the right there, you can see, for example, Jenner's diary, which shows that he worked hard, but not desperately hard a lot of the time. Uh, you'll find the notebook in which the thing about Dr. Waite's gingerbread biscuits is written, and his name is above your head, flanked by Hunter, and interestingly by Darwin, as you go up the stairs. And I think it's entirely appropriate that he should be there, even though he might not have been the first to experiment with vaccination. He was not perfect, but he was the man that put it on the map. And Francis Galton and later William Osler said, credit goes to the man who convinces the world, not necessarily to the man to whom the idea first occurs. And I think that's entirely right. So just to round up, we started with Jenner. We've tracked right the way through, and I now need, just in the last few minutes, just to introduce an anti-hero, in my view, who was ex-doctor Andrew Wakefield. And the anti-vaccinationists, to give the context, are still going very strong today. And if you just Google anti-vaccination, you will discover quite a lot of interesting things. For example, there are two societies in America, both with very respectable sounding titles, who are putting out the line that a battered baby death was actually due to a vaccine reaction. And this is an ongoing legal case at the moment. And the evidence, as I understand it, is very strongly that this is actually a battered baby. But the line has been put out that this is actually a vaccination reaction. And the two organizations, or two of them, that are supporting this line are the Council of Chiropractic Pediatricians. And there's a bit of a conflict, I think, between a chiropractic and a pediatrician, which I don't quite understand. And the incredibly respectable-looking Association of American Physicians and Surgeons. And that sounds like a really credible global umbrella organization for medical practitioners in the US. But again, from what I've seen, please look them up, make up your own minds. But I don't think it looks terribly good to me. There's also a thing called the Campaign Against Fraud in Medical Research. It sounds really kosher. But uh, if you read what they're 
pushing at the moment, they are claiming that the Gulf War syndrome, which, as you know, may or may not exist, is due only to vaccination reactions. That's the only cause for it. And also that the AIDS virus and the Ebola virus are man-made. Um, I have put down Dr. Vera Scheibner. Please make a note of her name and look her up if you've got time. I won't say anything about it because I'd like you to do that as a bit of homework and make up your own opinions about what you think about her. So Dr. Vera, and it is spelt like that, that is the proper spelling, Scheibner. She's in Australia. And just the link to uh, ex-Dr. Wakefield is the Age of Autism. And this is now a daily web newspaper which gives you daily updates on the new epidemic of autism. And autism has been around for a long time. It's a serious, serious issue. It's a real curse on the sufferer and on the family. It is getting very, very common. And again, there are lots of legal, uh, there's lots of legal interest in this. There are lots of specialists setting themselves up uh, with a particular interest in autism. It doesn't look as though this epidemic is necessarily driven by a true increased incidence of the disease. And this is where uh, Andrew Wakefield comes in because he published a paper in 1998 in The Lancet claiming to have found a connection between uh, vaccination with MMR, measles, mumps, rubella, and the subsequent development of gut disease, Crohn's disease, and also with autism in children. And this was published, again, in The Lancet, so the, one of the top three highest profile medical journals on the planet. Uh, it caused quite a bit of controversy immediately, uh, and it took the editor of The Lancet, he's not here, is he? I don't think he is. It took him an awfully long time, it took him about a dozen years to actually get the thing properly reviewed and critiqued and retracted. And it's now turned out, thanks to a fairly exhaustive investigation by the BMJ, who had a bit of a crusade against him, so they may have gone about it with a bit of extra enthusiasm. But I think the evidence is convincing that this wasn't just bad science, this was science driven by money. And basically, as it says there, Andrew Wakefield was hired by a solicitor to help uh, a group of parents sue the vaccine manufacturers. The fallout of that is familiar to all of us. It's much worse than just bad science. Uh, this is another long shadow of the anti-vaccination movement, if you like. Uh, the arrow there at the top is where his paper came out. And this rather busy little graph, the vertical blue bars are the percentage uptake of the MMR vaccine in newborn children. And you need to be above that dotted horizontal line in order for the population as a whole to be protected by what's called herd immunity. In other words, you've got enough protected individuals, so if a case of infection does break out, then there are enough protected people to block it and prevent it from running away. And you'll see that after that paper, the blue bars actually fall below that threshold, and they've remained below the threshold. The most recent data suggests that they're now close to that threshold again. But there's a very predictable outcome of that, and that is the red line, which shows the rising incidence of measles. Uh, measles is a bad disease. Many of us, I had it as a child, I was lucky. Um, it's still one of the major killers in the developing world of kids under the age of five. It's an eminently preventable disease. So for an eminently pre preventable, damaging disease to be coming back in an allegedly civilized society such as ours in the 21st century tells us two things. The first thing is it's disgraceful. And the second thing is it tells us about the power of the anti-vaccination arguments compared with the messages that conventional medicine and conventional science are putting out. So there's something fundamentally wrong about the way that we are going about trying to portray the positive benefits of vaccination. We are appealing to the wrong bits of the emotional circuitry, if you like, of an awful lot of people. Otherwise, this would not be happening. So measles is coming back in the UK and Ireland and Canada. And in France, first quarter of 2011, there were an astonishing 6,400 cases. That's the biggest number by far for the last 30 years in France. We don't want things to be heading the way that they still are in countries where they are crying out for vaccination against diseases like measles. And in India at the moment, there's great concern because there's not enough measles vaccine to go around. It can't be distributed properly. And at the moment in India, about 130,000 kids a year are killed by measles. So in India, you have people crying out for measles vaccine. In the UK, we've got people saying, no, we don't want it. And it's not just their kids that they're putting at risk, like the little lad on the left of the smallpox outbreak in Leicester, 
it's the rest of society because if the population as a whole falls below that critical threshold, then we're in trouble, all of us. But it's not an easy thing. And we're talking about moving targets. Smallpox is no longer with us, so it would be crazy to protect us, to immunize us against smallpox. After 9-11, the Americans were worried that smallpox might come back as a bioterrorist weapon. And it would be quite a good one. It wouldn't be perfect, it would be, be quite good. So they vaccinated an awful lot of American servicemen just in case. And that then enabled us to know what the true incidence of the side effects of the modern smallpox vaccine is. And it kills about one person in a million, but it also gives myocarditis, or inflammation of the heart muscle, to about one in 5,000. So it's not without risks. So when the diseases are there, you have a landscape that looks a particular way, and you can evaluate the risk of having the vaccination. It's probably better to be vaccinated when the disease is disappearing then the dynamics can change. And we're talking about not just the evidence of good versus harm, we're talking about the benefits of an emotional reaction. So whether people don't like something because it's against religious principles or because they think the science is bad or because they've heard somebody charismatic and powerful talking about it on TV. And it does come down to the benefits of this against that. And this is an argument in which the heart often wins over the brain. So just to give you a, I was going to say a terminal question, that's quite the wrong word, you know what I mean. A wind-up question, what would you do? You know, how are you going to react to this? And you need to be able to weigh up the evidence. I've presented you one view of the evidence. Again, I do encourage you to go onto the website because your interpretation of what I've put here may be different. Just in the last two minutes, um, I would encourage you all to go and visit, virtually or better still, in person, Dr. Jenner's house, which used to be the Edward Jenner Museum. Uh, it's in Berkeley. It is actually his house. So somewhere around there was where he vaccinated James Phipps. And like all small independent museums, its financial state is quite precarious at the moment. So any outrageously generous donations you can give will be very, very gratefully received. Uh, the other thing I will plug, I'm afraid, is this book. Um, it was kindly mentioned at the beginning by Frank that I did five years as dean and then needed a year's rehabilitation to recover from that. And I took the year off to research a book on the history of vaccination and smallpox. And it was a great delight to jump on the bike and cycle 20 minutes up the road to Jenna's house where the archives are. So it was great fun. Um, why should you buy this book? Well, I'll tell you why. All the royalties are actually going to Dr. Jenna's house. There are only 87 shopping days left at Christmas. <laughs> Perfect Christmas gift. And the book actually is not that too bad because it was shortlisted for the Wellcome Trust Book Prize or the Medical Booker Award type thing and a couple of other things. And it didn't do too badly. But more importantly, it is a book that may change your life, possibly forever. We've talked a lot about evidence. So I'm just going to close with a bit of very important evidence. Here's a friend of mine with the book before he's got into it. And here he is shortly after. <laughs> so thank you very much indeed.